The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things that we note and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Now we're dealing with uh, prayer here, and we're dealing with the fact that the Pharisees, the religious people, the legalists, uh, much like a lot of the people around here today or around the whole country, they hold to a form of the spiritual life, and they do not uh, function under the real spiritual life. And we get the form of the spiritual life from Second Timothy. They are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And they hold to a form of the spiritual life, a superficial form. And they think they're spiritual because of their manner of dress. They think they're spiritual because of the vocabulary they use. They think they're spiritual because of what they do or do not do. And all of this is incorrect. And Jesus Christ is going to bring this out in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And it says here, whenever you pray, now he's talking to the disciples, Whenever you disciples pray, do not, also the other people assembled there, do not be like the hypocrites, because they love to pray while standing in synagogues and on street corners so that people can see them. And so he is really a lambasting the religious folks, the religious people who are a sitting in front of him. And he's telling them, look, you have an approbation lust, an approval lust. You yearn for the attention of people. And you humanize God. And you think that because man praises you for praying out in public, that God too will praise you. And God does not. God thinks you're gross. God thinks you're out of line. You do not uh, pray in order to seek the attention of people. What a disgusting thing. And that is what they were doing. They would pray on the street corner in order for people to look at them and say, my, aren't they spiritual? And the same thing occurs today when people go to church once on Sunday, they go there to be patted on the back and say, well, thank you for coming to my church this once on Sunday. And, uh, and uh, thank you for living such a moral life. Well, it's people praising them and not God because God does not praise such things. And Jesus Christ brings this out very clearly. Uh, don't pray out loud. and Well, you can pray in a public setting if you know how. But don't pray trying to seek the approval of man. And that is what they've been doing. Truly, I say to you, they have received full payment or they have truly received their reward. Their reward is the uh, temporal payment of people uh, praising them. That's their reward, and that's all they get, is a bunch of praise from uh, depraved men. And the depravity of man praises all of these uh, people. And that's what they want, and that's what they get, the praise of man, but not the praise of God. And God does not praise them for acting like fools. God does not praise them or uh, send any type of blessing their way because uh, they want to receive the attention of people. What a disgusting thing. Uh, people, all we are are a bunch of sin natures. And when you receive the praise from a bunch of people with sin natures, you're receiving nothing. So they've already received the reward, which is nothing. And then in verse 6, But when you pray, go into your room having closed the door, and pray to your Father. 
Now this is indicating privacy. It's indicating the true issue of prayer, and that is so that your prayers can be heard by God. And people are not the issue, God is. And this was new, by the way, to the Jews. And Jesus Christ is teaching them a new method of prayer. Because before, in the Old Testament, they would pray to the pre-incarnate Christ. They would pray to Jehovah the second member of the Trinity. Well, now Jesus Christ comes to the earth and says, all right, there's going to be a change of method. No longer do you pray to me the pre, as pre-incarnate Christ, but now you pray to God the Father. But when you pray, go into your room, having closed the door, and pray to your Father, brand new, but something that they must follow and something we must follow. When we go into prayer, we don't pray to Jesus Christ. We do not pray to God the Holy Spirit. We pray to God the Father in privacy, that is, in our private prayers. And your Father who always sees will reward you. And that is true reward because uh, uh, God knows that you're praying directly to Him, not seeking after the approbation of people, not caring about what people think, but simply wanting to have a conversation with God, as it were, and to ask for what you need, and so on. Verse 7, And when you pray, do not use meaningless repetitions like the Gentiles. Again, Christ is being very, very insulting just about. He's calling them Gentiles. And the last thing a Jew wants to be called is a Gentile. And he's saying, you pray just like the Gentiles pray. And he's saying, uh, uh, he goes on to say, for they, the Gentiles, think that they will be heard for their many words. They think that because they have constant repetition, that somehow a God will hear them. Well, they're thinking just like Gentiles, just like unbelievers. So point one. Again, Christ equates the religious people of Israel with the Gentiles. Christ equates the religious people of Israel with the Gentiles. And this, uh, by way of uh, knowing something from historical context, this is one of the highest insults that could ever be levied against a Jew. The worst thing you could call a Jew was a Gentile because they thought, uh, well, they were racially superior. Uh, they had this ingrained in them since uh, the time uh, they were growing up in the family. So this is one of the highest insults that could be leveled against them, for they all know that they pray in this manner. All of them know that they do these repetitious uh, type things, and when they pray, they nod their head up and down and uh, pray the same thing over and over again and make sure that they pray longer than the person next to them so that they can be seen as more spiritual. So they're caught. Jesus Christ has caught them. And Jesus Christ peers right into their souls. He sees right through their superficiality. And guess what? You too can see through the superficiality of man when you have the Word of God in your soul. And you can see when people are faking you out. And you can see when people are trying to act spiritual rather than actually being spiritual. And you can see when someone tries to use a phony religious language, such as, a good morning, brother, how are you? And there are some people, you may have never met them, but there are some people who actually act that way. And they act that way because, well, they have something to hide. They're hiding the fact that they don't know the Word of God. And so they have to put on a superficial front. And they have to act spiritual. So don't be bamboozled by these folks. They are simply religious and way out of line. And then he goes on to say, uh, well, they all know that they pray in this manner simply to be seen by men thinking that God will uh, answer their many repetitions. Point two, the religious crowd would use many words to outpray their neighbor. Why did they use many words? Well, when they got in a public setting and they had a prayer meeting, they would all kneel at the altar as they would in, in those days, or they would uh, follow the function of prayer as they prayed in those days, and they would go on and on, repeating themselves and uh, coming up with a lot of words. 
meaningless words, really, just so that uh, people would think they were spiritual. And they would uh, maybe they would go on and pray for an hour and 15 minutes. And it would be like a battle, a competition between everyone. And they do it today in churches. I don't know how many of you have visited churches like this, but I've been to a couple, unfortunately, in which uh, you go to the church and then uh, they make you kneel and, and to go in prayer. And kneeling is fine if you're doing it for the right reasons because I kneel uh, when I pray because it keeps me awake. It's an uncomfortable position and I can concentrate better kneeling. But you can pray just as effectively laying down or standing up or sitting in your car. Uh, you can pray just about anywhere and be effective at it. It doesn't really matter if you kneel or not, but they kneel, and so they get the pious look on their faces while they kneel. And so during that kneeling process, they all start to pray at the same time very loud, and it sounds terrible. It sounds like a bunch of mass confusion. And they continue and continue until the last person uh, until finally they give out and there's one person left praying and they're left praying because they want to be seen as the most spiritual. How disgusting is that? But it's true and that's how they function. So, uh, but when you pray, go into your room having closed the door and pray to your Father. A concept of privacy showing that you are praying directly to God the Father and you don't really care what people think. Pray to God the Father in privacy, and your Father who always sees will reward you. And when you pray, do not use meaningless repetition like the Gentiles. There's the insult. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. So he's just brought it down to their level and said, Look, you pray like this. I know all of you do, because they did in those days. They prayed in competition with each other and all of that. And he said, Look, you're no better than a Gentile. And when he said that, it was just as if he was cursing them out. Chapter 6, verse 8. Therefore, do not imitate them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So again, this is another insult, because up until this point, they had been imitating Gentiles. And they had always thought of themselves as the great Jews. And they are and were a great race chosen by God. But they took that and manifested in great uh, thinking that they were racially superior. And Jesus Christ is going to have to hammer them on this over and over again. And we'll see how he does because he brings up the Gentiles in comparison with the Jews over and over and over again all throughout Matthew. So he's trying to rid them of this racial prejudice. But he knows where to hit them hard. And he says, uh, you're imitating the Gentiles. Therefore, do not imitate them, the Gentiles. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. And then you say, well, why do I even pray if God the Father already knows? Well, the answer is very simple. And that's because it's a part of our faith rest drill. And when we go to God in prayer, it's actually a type of self, uh, well, it makes us, uh, it makes us uh, it's a use of the faith rest drill because it, it strengthens our faith. And uh, he does know what we need before we ask him, but if you were here when uh, we studied the divine decrees, in eternity past, uh, God had programmed every prayer you would ever make into the computer of divine decrees. And that's how we described it. And so God the Father knows even before you pray what you're going to pray for. And since you pray for it, he might answer you affirmatively and say, yes, I answer that prayer. Well, that was considered in eternity past, and the answer was given in eternity past, and it comes to fruition today. And so prayer does have its uh, place. And just because he knows that you're going to pray that, and just because he knows that he's going to answer affirmatively, doesn't mean that you forsake uh, your duty to pray. And it is our duty when we are spiritual. And when you are filled with God the Holy Spirit, then it is up to us to pray and to pray for a lot of different things. I don't know if some of you were here during the uh, time that I spent uh, studying prayer in which we went over all the concepts of prayer. If you don't know, we'll make a CD for you. And then chapter 6, verse 9. So pray in this manner. Now this is a model of prayer for us. A model of prayer. 
but we are not to reproduce these words because some of these words do not apply to us at all. And you have to understand dispensations to understand that uh, some of these words cannot apply to us. For example, uh, he, goes, he goes on to say, Our Father in, in heaven. Now that is how the prayer begins. Our Father in heaven. And this means that all of our prayers are to be addressed to God the Father. May your name be set apart. That means hallowed be thy name. It actually means may your name be set apart. And this is referring to uh, you setting apart God by being in fellowship. And that is you've named your sins to God. You're filled with God the Holy Spirit. That is for us. And so we are in fellowship. We're not in carnality. So the Father receives a set-apart name by us uh, 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 praying the prayer in fellowship. Then in chapter 6, verse 10, May your kingdom... What is the kingdom? We studied that in the dispensations when we went over those. The kingdom is the 1,000-year reign of Christ on the earth. It is the rule of Jesus Christ on the earth which is to come. We live in the church age. This is not the time of the kingdom. So today we don't pray, may your kingdom come. Because his kingdom will come, but not today and not tomorrow. If the resurrection were to occur tonight, the kingdom would come approximately seven years after that. So his kingdom is not going to come now. So we can't pray that. If we do pray that, we're praying in ignorance. Uh, we're, we're praying for Jesus Christ's kingdom to come. It's not going to come in the church age. Besides, we have far greater than what the kingdom is going to have. So pray in this manner. Our Father in heaven, may your name be set apart. May your kingdom come. That's the rule of Jesus Christ on the earth. You have to remember that the audience at this time is a Jewish audience for the most part. There were some Gentiles there, of course. But he's preaching the coming of the kingdom and he's telling them how to pray for the kingdom. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can't pray that. The will of God will never in this age be done on earth as it is in heaven. It cannot happen. And we have wars and rumors of wars. And, and during the millennium, which this is talking about, the thousand year reign of Christ, during the millennium, there will be no wars and rumors of wars. And the swords will be turned into plowshares and the spears into pruning hooks. And man shall learn war no more. And that's when the kingdom comes. And that is when the will of the Father is done on earth just as, as it is done in heaven. But it is not done today. And we can't pray that. If we pray that, we are showing our abject ignorance of the Word of God and our abject in ignorance in terms of rightly dividing the Word of Truth and our abject ignorance of dispensations. So this is referring to tribulational saints and the tribulational saints can pray this prayer. When the tribulation occurs after the resurrection of the church, there will be Jews in uh, the, the hill country and they will be hiding up in the mountains. And uh, before Jesus Christ comes, uh, after approximately seven years, uh, they'll be up there and they will be praying this pray, prayer. And they will pray in the tribulation, Our Father in heaven, may your name be set apart. May your kingdom come. And of course the people in the tribulation are ready for his kingdom to come because that would establish peace on the earth. And on top of that, it would establish Israel as the client nation and those generals and all of those people hiding in the mountains will be saved. So, of course, they must pray this. For us to pray this would be ignorant. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, although uh, we can't pray uh, for this, uh, we can pray that God's will be done. And when we pray we must always preface our request with this. Uh, we might have a request for someone. Someone may be ill and we may say, uh, Father, heal uh, my uh, grandmother who's very ill. What you should say is, Father, if it be your will, will, W-I-L-L, -L, if it be your will, 
heal uh, my grandmother who is sick. And then if it's his will, he will do it. But we, almost, we always must pray in accordance with God's will. So again, uh, uh, 6, 9 through 6, uh, 10 is a reference to what the tribulational Jews will have to pray and not what we will have to pray. And we don't have to pray what even follows this because it's still dealing with a different age. It's not dealing with the church age. That Jesus Christ hadn't even yet revealed the church age. He's talking to mainly Jews. He's talking to the age of Israel. He's not talking to us. 6.11 Give us tomorrow's needs today. That is the corrected translation. Actually what it's saying is give us tomorrow's needs today. And that's from the Greek. It is a corrected translation. Or give us this day our daily bread Actually, it's saying is uh, give us uh, today tomorrow's bread or give us uh, today tomorrow's needs. So they needed tomorrow's bread today because of their position as ambassadors. That's in the tribulation. You see, times are so rough in the tribulation. Uh, they're going to go ahead and pray for tomorrow's bread. Uh, we can't think like that because we all usually have full tummies and there's a, very rarely do we ever go without food because our country's so wealthy. But in the tribulation, they're going to go through some very hard economic times. And they're going to go ahead and pray for tomorrow's bread. Give us tomorrow's needs today. And that's because of their position as ambassadors. And then verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Now this sets up a policy of grace and it's actually a grace analogy and it's actually referring to something called a fortiori with greater reason. So it sets up a grace analogy and the illustration that if humans can forgive on the basis of grace and they can, uh, unbelievers by the way can forgive on the basis of grace, an unbeliever could let another unbeliever borrow money. And then that other unbeliever has hard times and says, listen, buddy, I can't pay you back. And he might just say, you know what? I forgive you of that debt. You don't have to pay me back. I understand what you're going through. That is an illustration of grace. And unbelievers can even illustrate that. So this is an illustration. And so uh, this sets up a grace analogy in the illustration that if humans can forgive, even unbelievers, on the basis of grace then God, being infinitely superior, can definitely forgive us on the basis of grace. This is the point. It's an a fortiori. A fortiori in the Latin means with greater reason. So if we, as sinful mankind, can forgive each other, then with greater reason, God can forgive us. It's simply showing the grace of God and with greater reason showing it, and showing that God being infinitely superior, God being perfect, always functions in grace. And that's why we live under the grace policy, and we do not live under the policy of legalism, as so many people do today. So God being infinitely superior and greater can forgive us on the basis of grace. It is the same principle as 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Now we move to chapter 6, verse 13. And your Bible say temptation. And even in the book of James, this is translated temptation, but it's dealing with testing. And what it's saying is, in chapter 6, 13, it's completely different than uh, what you might think it means. It, is, uh, it actually says this, Do not carry us into testing. Yours might say, Do not uh, carry us into temptation. Or do not lead us into temptation. But guess what? Jesus Christ, as deity and true humanity, cannot lead you into testing. It's impossible. God cannot... or temptation. God cannot lead you into temptation because God can have nothing to do with sin. And this is not dealing with temptation to sin. 
We are tempted to sin from the source of our old sin nature, from the very members of our body. When we're born, we're born with a sin nature, and we are tempted from that, and sometimes we say, yes, I will sin, and sometimes we say, no, I will not. So God cannot tempt. Jesus Christ cannot tempt. So this is actually the corrected translation is do not carry us into testing. And what does that mean? This is saying that under pressure, when you come under pressure, and when people start to persecute you, and when you go under adversity, and when people don't listen to you, uh, when you even know what the Word of God has to say, and uh, they don't know, or they don't care, and uh, you uh, consider this testing. Well, uh, it says, do not carry us into testing. It means, Lord, I want to stand on my own. Don't carry me. You've given me phenomenal spiritual assets. I don't need to be carried. I'll follow in your footsteps and I will endure the testing because you've given me the ability to handle it. What it's saying is, don't pick, don't hold me by the hand, Lord, as so many people like him to do. And they, and they like to go in prayer when something goes wrong and say, God, get me out of this situation. Well, these mature believers say, you know what? I can handle this, God. You've given me the ability to do so. It's not that you can handle it. Uh, you're not saying, step aside, I can handle it from self-righteousness. You're saying, look, you've given me the spiritual assets to handle this situation. So do not carry me. You're already carrying me with your word. In other words, you're not insulting God as so many people do when they go into prayer. And they, pray, they try to pray themselves out of a bad situation. And God's probably up there as it were. This is an anthropopathism. Scratch, or an anthropomorphism actually. Scratching his head wondering, uh, why are you asking me for this when I've given you so much to handle this yourself? And especially for us in the church age. Now he's talking to people who will be in the, uh, well, the age of Israel as a continuation of that in the, in the tribulation and in the millennium. And that is a continuation, by the way, of the age of Israel. That's why the tribulation is called Daniel's 70th week. It's because it's, it's an extension of the age of Israel. And Israel becomes a client nation once again in the millennium, an extension of the age of Israel. And their spiritual life in the millennium is inferior to ours now. So today we have even less of a reason to uh, think of uh, Christ as having to carry us. And he does through his word, through his doctrine. And we can get through any situation by knowing the ten problem-solving devices. Hopefully you remember them. And if you don't, then go through them with your head with me. Rebound. The filling of God, the Holy Spirit. The faith rest drill in four categories. Grace orientation. Doctrinal orientation. A personal sense of destiny. Personal love for God the Father. Impersonal love for all mankind. Plus H, sharing the happiness of God. And then finally, occupation with Christ. These things can carry you through anything and everything in life through every testing. So he won't have to carry us physically. He won't have to bail us out of the situation because he already has through the scripture and especially through the church age doctrines which we've been learning. Now in verse uh, 6, 16, we're going to move to fasting. But I will continue with six thirteen. Do not carry us into testing, but deliver us from the source. This is the agent concept from the Greek. They didn't pick up on it because uh, what happens, you say, well, where did our New Testament come from? Well, what happened is, is they take uh, some scholars, some of whom are good scholars, and some of whom were lazy, but they still got the degree. So when they started to translate uh, Matthew, for example, uh, some of them were very well versed in Greek. Some of them were very well versed in Aramaic. And they could uh, come up with a translation. That's why throughout scripture, in some places, they'll have the word metanoieo in the Greek. And in the NIV in one place, there's the word in the Greek metanoieo. And if you have an NIV, you'll see that. In which uh, they translate it, change of mind. 
But then uh, when you get to another part of the Bible, it says metanoieo again in the NIV. And then they just go ahead and translate it repent. Well, it's two different people translating the Bible. And there's not just one person who has translated your Bible. There were a, a bunch of people who got together. One person took up one section. Another person took up another section. So even in the NIV, if you ever read uh, through it, and you'll see in one place, change your mind, and you'll see in another place, repentance. Well, one of the guys knew enough to say, hey, we don't live in the uh, old English anymore. I'll translate it as it is, change your mind. And another guy was either a legalist or was just lazy and copied it from another Bible and said, yes, that's repentance. So uh, your translation is not accurate. It's, it's, it's pretty close nowadays. If you have the King James version, it's way off. It's way off because we don't understand Old English. Now, some of it was very good if you could decipher Old English, but we don't have time to learn a whole other language, and that is what Old English is. And so when in the Old English it says repentance, during Shakespeare's time, they knew what that meant. They knew repentance was a change of mind. They really uh, didn't have any emotional connotation to it at all. When they saw repentance, they would say, change your mind. But they didn't even have those types of words. They would just say, repent, and put it all together. So your Bible is a conglomeration of a bunch of different scholars translating it. Now, I'm going off the translation of Colonel R.B. Theme, and I know personally, since he was my pastor, that he took great effort to make sure that all of these things, all of these passages were translated correctly so that we could come to understand their true meaning. And I know it's right, and if you have any question of it, then you can just uh, listen to him because he gives you the gnomic tense, all the tenses. I can't even describe to you how it is presented. And if you were ever to study Greek on your own, uh, you would see that, hey, yeah, that's right. And I've studied it somewhat on my own and went along with it and saw that he says this is a gnomic tense. And then you go look and say, well, yes, that is a gnomic tense. But of course, he, it, it's ac it, it is accurate. So if you want to question that, then, uh, then dig into the Greek and figure it out yourself. But it is accurate. So uh, 6, uh, 13, but deliver us from the source of the evil ones. Now, what is the source of the evil one? One of the, you know what the uh, devil's ace trump is? That is his uh, playing card. It's like he has a uh, ace up his sleeve. Let's say uh, Satan's playing blackjack. He always keeps an ace up his sleeve. And what is that ace? Religion. That is his playing card. And religion is how Satan functions. So from the source of it would be religion. What's from the source of the evil one? Religion is from the source of the evil one. Why do we have a bunch of Islamic terrorists? It's from the source of the evil one. He has brainwashed them so much that they actually come to believe that if they blow themselves up by killing Christians and Jews, that they will go to heaven and have 70 virgins waiting for them. Well, that's from the source of the evil one. What's also from the source of the evil one? Religion, legalism, people thinking that they can be saved by their good works. So that is what 613 means. And continuing. Now we're moving to the concept of, of fasting in chapter 6, verse 16. I'm going to go back and look this up and make sure I didn't uh, miss something. And lead us not into temptation. Do not carry us into testing. And that is a much better translation because remember, God cannot send us into temptation. Do you think God tempts you to sin? That would be blasphemous. God can have nothing to do with sin. So you can see the erroneousness of the translation. You can see the fact that if those people translating this part of the Bible had had any doctrine, had any sense of what, who and what God was all about, they would say to themselves when they started to translate it, now how in the world can God the Father tempt people to sin? But they have no sense. They just go on uh, uh, flippity-floppity. Don't, they, don't, they make no sense. So, again, uh, uh, continuing on, and then it goes to 15. 
uh, and I did not, I don't think I did put this in here, but in uh, chapter 15, but if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Now this simply has to do with a mental attitude dynamic. This has to do with the fact that if someone insults you and you react to it, if someone calls you a name and you react in hatred, in gossip, in maligning, and in judging, if you do so, then your Father in Heaven will not forgive you either because you're not functioning under your spiritual life. You're still functioning in carnality. You're functioning under sin. So this is a description of a, a grace-type attitude. So, if you name your sins to God and then immediately do not resume with a grace orientation and you always have strife and bitterness in your life and you're always wanting to gossip, malign, and judge other people, then you will not be forgiven because you've fallen right back into sin and you're not forgiven till you name that sin. But people who do this feel justified. I have a right to be angry with so-and-so because they did this to me. And you do not have a right ever to be angry with anyone. You do not have a right ever to gossip about anyone. You do not have a right ever to malign or to judge anyone. That is left for the prerogative of God to judge, not our prerogative. So when we judge someone, we are actually taking the place of God. God is the true judge. We do not have the capability to judge all the human race. Yet all the Baptists around here want to judge the human race. All the religions around here want to judge the human race. And they want to look down their noses at people. But that's not how we function under the Christian way of life, neither today nor back then during the times of the disciples. So continuing in uh, 6.16, and this is dealing with fasting. Now again, I'll tell you what fasting is all about. The concept goes beyond simply abstaining from food. These people who fasted, they didn't just simply say, for the Lord today, I will not eat. Or for the Lord for the next three days, I will not eat. That wasn't the issue. The issue wasn't the fact that they did not eat, although they did not eat. The issue was they weren't eating because they spent so much time in prayer and they spent so much time listening to the Word of God, and they spent so much time meditating on the Word of God, they did not find time to eat. Now this is how zealous some people were for the Word of God. It was very few and far between. But you see what the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites had done, what the religious crowd had done, is they had uh, heard of the concept of fasting. Well, they turned it into a completely superficial thing. And they said, if I deprive myself from food, God will smile upon me. And that's ridiculous. The only thing they did was get hungry. And they were idiots. And God wasn't impressed because they weren't meditating on the Word in order to get hungry. And they weren't listening to the Word of God in, in order to skip a meal. Now, for example, it would be as if you lived during the days of the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul would get up probably at 8 in the morning and start teaching. And by the time 5 o'clock rolled around, the Apostle Paul would still be standing up teaching to very large crowds. And, and, and during that time, they would not have the ability to go eat because he's preaching. And they want to listen to his word. And they want to listen to the word of God. So they would forsake lunch or they would forsake dinner in order to listen to the Apostle Paul. That's the true concept of fasting. Uh, but the religious crowd had distorted it into something being merely superficial, something as if uh, they wake up in the morning, and whether they listen to the Word of God or not is not the issue. Uh, they turn the issue into, I am not eating. They turn the issue on themselves, and they say, look at me, I do not eat for the Lord. But true fasting says, uh, not look at me. True fasting says, I love the Word of God so much that I am willing to sit here all day long, forsake my lunch and my dinner in order to listen to this. And then when it's finished, I'll go out and gorge myself. But right now, I'm too busy to eat. And probably a lot of the people didn't even think about eating. Now, we don't do this today. It's not part of something that we do now in this church age, now that the canon of Scripture has been complete. 
and none of us really ever have a reason to fast, and none of us look like we fast ever. But we shouldn't. But we really shouldn't. Oh, we shouldn't deprive ourselves of meals. Uh, I get up and teach one hour a day. Go ahead and eat before you get here. And then learn the Word of God. Now, that's just the concept of fasting. But he had to bring it up because uh, these people were abusing this concept. Chapter six, sixteen. When you fast, do not be like the hypocrites, for they make their faces unattractive so that people will see them fasting. Now they would make their faces unattractive. Now that's a corrected translation. In 6.16 in the NIV or NASB, I don't know which one I'm reading from, it says, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. And that's a pretty good translation right there. And they would. Uh, they would make a, uh, they would disfigure their faces. They would try to appear as if they were starving to death so that they would appear as, they were fa as if they were fasting. They would put a very sour look on their face. Maybe hang their head low and look as if they had a headache or something. And so that people would look at them and say, Oh, they're so spiritual, they're fasting. But Jesus Christ calls them on it. What he's saying is, You're a bunch of phonies! When you fast, do not be like the hypocrites, for they make their faces unattractive so that people will see them fasting. And this is dealing with approval lust again. They want to receive the approbation, the accolades of man. They want people to pat them on the back and say, boy, you're fasting. Well, surely they already have their reward. I tell you the truth, they have their reward. And their reward is a bunch of people patting them on the back. Well, big deal. And you see a lot of people join big churches because they want to be patted on the back. And a lot of people like to join uh, churches because they want the pastor to say, good job, you're being spiritual. But it's not the pastor's business what you're doing. It's the pastor's business to teach the Word of God. It's not the pastor's business to stick his nose into your business. And if the pastor does not praise you, you well, uh, just remember, your relationship is between you and God. And so people always have people emphasis over God emphasis. And because of that, they're destroying their spiritual lives. And this is what the Pharisees had. This is what the religious people had. They had a people emphasis over a God emphasis. They would rather have the praise of man than the accolades of God, as it were. They were very blasphemous people. And then in chapter 6, verse 17, When you fast, put hair oil on your head, and wash your face. Now what does that mean? When you fast, put hair oil on your head and wash your face. Well, uh, when I had longer hair than I do now where it could be parted, and it's starting to get uh, so fuzzy now I need to get it shaved off again, but when I had longer hair, it wasn't long, but it was just long enough to put a part in it. I would put gel in it so it would keep the part. That's the concept. Jesus is saying here, well, when you fast, when you go and you meditate on the Word of God, when you decide you want to learn the Word of God all day and you're not going to eat because of it, when you do so, put gel in your hair. In other words, groom yourself very well. Put a nice part like mine used to be, a part right here, and just gel it so it would stay in place. So what he's saying, hair oil is the same as gel. We use hair gel today, then they used hair oil. When you fast, put hair oil on your head and wash your face. In other words, groom yourself. Make yourself look as if you're not even hungry or not even fasting. Don't try to make yourself look all pitiful to man. Instead, dress yourself up, and when you're learning the Word of God and when you're uh, 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 fasting, as it were, because of your constant meditation, well, you dress up, just as you normally would, you part your hair just as you normally would in order that man will not know what you're doing. And that's all he's saying. When you fast, put hair gel in your hair and wash your face. That's the concept. So that it will not be obvious to others when you are fasting, but only to your Father who is in secret. 
In other words, you're doing it as unto the Lord. And everything we do in life must be done as unto the Lord, not as unto man. And that's why later in Scripture it tells us to work just as hard when the boss is away as when the boss is right there. There's no difference. But in the uh, sin nature, there is a difference. When the boss leaves, well, the, the mouse will play and they will uh, stop working so hard. But when the boss is there, everybody works hard. Well, what he's saying as a Christian, hey, look, you work as unto the Lord all the time. Don't change your manner of living because of people. And this is what Christ is saying. Don't change what you're doing. Uh, don't try to make yourself appear as if you're fasting to people. You shouldn't care what people think. You should care what your Father who is in heaven should think, and you should do it in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So all of this through chapter 617 is dealing with a bunch of phony people. And we have a bunch of phony people today in our country. And they act phony. And they want to appear holy. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm never going to change my lifestyle to simply appear holy. And a lot of people may say, your lifestyle doesn't look like that of a pastor. Well, of course it doesn't, because I don't want to appear holy to anyone. It's not your business what I do in my life, as long as I'm teaching you the Word of God. I don't care what people think, and this is the way Jesus was. He didn't care what people thought, and he's teaching them, you too shouldn't care. You too shouldn't try to put on a phony face. You're phony. All of you are a bunch of sinners, and we all are, myself included, and everyone else in the human race is a sinner. So try to cover it up. No! Simply grow in grace and in knowledge. And then people will recognize you for your tranquility of soul, but not for your legalism, and not because you're always gossiping, maligning, and judging, and ripping somebody down because they do something you do not like. And that's the way most churches are set up today, just like the synagogues back in Israel. They're set up so that people can gossip, so that people can judge other people, and so that they can say, look how that woman's dressed. I would never dress that way. She's hardly wearing nothing. Well, that's all superficiality. You should be living your own spiritual life as unto the Lord, and you should live your own spiritual life as unto the Lord and stop trying to live other people's spiritual life because it's, it's difficult enough to live our own even though it's not that difficult if you know the correct way to live the spiritual life. Now in chapter 6 verse 19, we're going to get the mental attitude in Christian service. What is your mental attitude that you should have as a Christian or when you are functioning under Christian service? And by the way, all of us who have believed in Christ are under full-time Christian service. It's not just me, and it's not just a few people who witness and evangelize and preach the gospel and preach doctrine. All of us, everyone, is in full-time Christian service. That is, everyone who has believed in Christ. So in chapter 6, 19, it says this, Do not make material things first on your scale of values. That is the corrected translation. Where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. This concept here is also taught in James in which he describes our life on the earth as a, as a mere vapor trail. Now, how many of you have looked up to the skies and you've seen a vapor trail from a jet? And you see them all the time. It's a white trail following behind a jet. Our lives are like a vapor trail. And just as soon as it appears, it's gone. That concept might be hard to uh, think of while you're young, but I knew of uh, some of my friends, 18 years old, dying in car crashes. So uh, their life was short. But even if you live to be 100, your life is a vapor trail. Very short. All of us have a very short life. And so the, the concept is, why are you always worrying about money? Uh, why is the first thing on your scale of values uh, having fun or material things or making sure that you have just enough? Because your life on this earth is a mere vapor trail and you must live your life in the light of eternity. And this is the point. 
All of us must live our life in the light of eternity because guess what? None of us will be here very long. And when you uh, compare eternity with 70 years, and if you're a man, uh, your average lifespan is what? 77 now or, or 78. And if you're a woman, it's 82 or 83. And if you happen to live that full lifespan, that's still a very short time compared to eternity. Eternity goes on for billions and billions of years. So this is just a drop in the bucket. So when you're in heaven, you have billions and billions of years to reflect on all the decisions you made on this tiny short time we've had on the earth. And you'll have all the time in the world to reflect on, was something more important for me than the word of God? Did I decide to myself I would rather watch a TV show or relax than watch the Word of God or than listen to the Word of God? Would I rather do something else in life than listen to the Word of God? And if your answer is yes, I would, then you're not living your life in the light of eternity and you'll be kicking yourself in the butt for all eternity because you're not going to receive the same rewards as those people who said, you know what, the Word of God is number one in my life. The Word of God is something that I need to learn. And you do so, and your motivation shouldn't be because you will receive reward. Your motivation should be because you love God the Father, because of all that He's given to us already, and because God first loved us, we have the ability to love God. So our motivation comes from love for God. But it's something for us to think about, that people who care not for the Word of God well, they're going to have an eternity. And really it will be an eternity because their escrow blessings will be on deposit forever. And they can always walk by and look in the safe, as it were, and see their name on it. But not have access to those rewards because they did not follow the spiritual life. So the concept here is live your life in the light of, in the light of eternity. Chapter 6, verse 20. But accumulate for yourselves treasures. For us, this deals with the rewards that result from executing the unique spiritual life. And when we execute the unique spiritual life of all times, we receive reward. But if we fail to execute the unique spiritual life, we receive shame in a resurrection body. It's the oxymoron of all of human history and all of angelic history. Now what I'm telling you is that yes, when you're in heaven, and this is in part, this is in scripture, and it's part of scripture, when you are in heaven, if you have not lived this spiritual life on the earth, now you'll be there because you've believed in Christ. If you don't live your spiritual life, you're still going to heaven because that's the grace of God. But if you as a believer do not make the word of God number one in your life, and you do not listen to the Word of God on a consistent daily basis, and you don't grow to what is called pleroma to theu, the fullness of blessing from God, then when Jesus Christ comes in the resurrection, comes down to meet us in the air, in the clouds, then we must not shrink and be ashamed. Now those who have not fulfilled their unique spiritual life will actually feel shame in a resurrection body in heaven. Now that's an oxymoron. And because uh, heaven is a place of happiness. And believe me, those people who will feel shame before our Lord will be glad they're there in heaven. And they will be there if they have believed in Christ. But if they believed in Christ and said, Goodbye, God, I'll see you in eternity because I know I'll see you and that's a good thing to know. But when they start to die, they'll realize they failed. And then when they go to heaven it will be emphasized, that is, during the tribulation, that is the tribulation on the earth. Now remember, we don't go through the tribulation. During the tribulation, all of us as church age believers will be in heaven and we will be going under what's called the Bema seat, the evaluation throne. And while we're being evaluated, there will be those who have been winners in the spiritual life and many, many, many who have been losers. And those many who were losers will feel ashamed. So Christ is trying to uh, warn them about these things. But accumulate for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. In other words, learning the word of God is an eternal treasure. 
We always think of getting rich or winning the jackpot, winning the lottery, going to Vegas and winning a million bucks. While it would be nice temporarily, I'll admit you that, it does not, well, as the country song says, there is no hearse with a luggage rack. You've never seen a hearse with a luggage rack. You don't take it with you. So when you die, you better have a better reward waiting for you on the other side. Besides these things uh, that uh, deal with the things of the, the earth. Now, I'm not telling you that it's wrong to get rich. Don't misinterpret that. It is not wrong to be rich. Abraham, in the Bible, was the richest man in the world at that time. And he was spiritually mature. You can be rich on this earth and also be extraordinarily rich in heaven. But that's because they had their priorities straight. The wealth didn't go to their head. And they, just because they were wealthy, uh, they didn't say, well, goodbye, God, I have wealth, I'm going to have all the fun I can right now because of all this wealth. And then, instead they said, oh, yes, I have this wealth, but the word of God is still number one, and if I lose this wealth, the word of God is still number one. And Job faced this problem. Job was the wealthiest man on the earth during his day. And then Satan went to God and said, look, I've noticed your servant Job, and I surmise that the only reason Job serves you is because of all the blessings you've given him on the earth. And so God knew better, and God said, all right, Satan, do what you want with him. You just can't kill him. You can take him all the way up to the point of death, but you can't kill him. And so he did. And then a tornado came and tore away his children. And he lost his children, whom he loved very much. Then his wife became a nag. And it doesn't say, but she did probably leave him. It doesn't really say. That's just a guess. But his wife definitely nagged him. And then uh, he broke out with boils. And there were boils on his body from head to toe. From the top of his skull to the bottom of his feet were boils. And he sat down in ash while his friends talked about how he must have done something terrible against God and how he must have sinned terribly, which he didn't, his so-called friends were wrong. And while they were ridiculing him, he sat there with glass and scraped the boils. And they oozed with pus. And it was extraordinarily painful. But guess what? What did Job say? Job said... The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He still had his focus on God, even through all of that. Now, in detail, if we study that, and we will in detail in the future, we will see that Job did fail a couple of times. But starting out, he said, The Lord gives and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So his eyes weren't on the things of this world. He was living his life in the light of eternity. And although he lost all of his wealth, he did not cry in his beer. He simply made a doctrinal statement, and his love for the Lord was just as strong as ever. So Satan was defeated. He was an Old Testament saint who defeated Satan, actually. And so the point became that it's not environment, it's volition. And he chose, no matter what circumstances he had in life, whether it was rich or poor, he always chose to serve the Lord. And then in chapter 6, verse 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your heart is a reference to your frontal lobe. Your heart is a reference to the stream of consciousness. Your heart is a reference to what you think. So if you think of your treasure as being in heaven, then you are living your life in the light of eternity. If you think of your treasure as being that which you can accumulate on the earth and only that, then you are not living your life in the light of eternity. Now you can be wealthy and you can go out and make money and you can be a capitalist and you can have a business and it doesn't mean you're not spiritual for doing so. But what Christ is saying is make sure that Bible doctrine is number one no matter what your financial status. Then in chapter 6, verse 22, and this is the actual corrected uh, translation. Now in your Bibles it might say, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. Now this is the corrected translation. The eye is the animation. 
And what this has to deal with is the fact that what you think can actually, especially from my perspective, be seen from the eyeballs. When I see eyeballs glaze over, I know no one's paying attention. When I see eyeballs light up, I know they finally learned something they've ever learned before. When I see eyeballs roll, they don't believe it, and I've seen them roll. And when I see people with a scrunched up face, it means they don't understand what I'm saying. So the eye is actually, it can be a mirror, especially for someone communicating the Word of God, in which uh, you know uh, what the person's thinking. Now, it doesn't work all the time because some people just uh, a daze off and glaze over and they're not listening. It doesn't mean they're not rejecting it. It just means they're not listening to you. And you can misinterpret that as rejection. But I'll tell you what, if you, if you neglect it and don't listen to it, you might as well reject it because you won't learn a thing. So the eye is the animation of the body. If your eye is without blemishes, now this is referring to a mental attitude. If your eye is without blemishes, this is referring to a mental attitude that is free from hatred, a mental attitude that is free from jealousy, a mental attitude that is free from bitterness, that is free from hostility. In other words, you have love in your heart and love in the stream of consciousness, a divine love, a love that you have grown to have. So the principle is you are what you think. And if you think outside, as an application to us, if you think outside of the unique spiritual life and you spend your time under mental attitude sins, then you will be a terrible person to hang around and you will also be on a road to destruction and you will not live your spiritual life. Now, if your eye is without blemish, that is without the old sin nature control from mental attitude sins, then your whole body will be animated. Now this refers to inner beauty. And the only way for all of us to have inner beauty is to have the Word of God in our souls. And for us in the church age, that means we have an understanding of the two power options, the three spiritual skills, the four spiritual mechanics, and the ten problem-solving devices. If we have an understanding of that, and if we have an understanding of the Word of God, and we can apply it in our lives, then we develop an inner beauty. And our eye will, will be without blemish, and our body will be animated. Now this is referring to inner beauty. And believe it or not, if you have inner beauty, it actually improves the way you look. Now there are some people who go the way of carnality. And if you've ever seen bitter people they age very quickly. Bitter people, now it doesn't go, and it doesn't mean if you're an ugly person who has aged very fast that you're full of sin. Now don't confuse that with what I'm saying. What I'm telling you is that if you've ever seen a bitter person who has been bitter their whole lives, well, they gain wrinkle, wrinkles very quickly. They become old very fast. And if you've ever seen a person who worries all the time, you start to see wrinkles start to poke up on their body. Or if you ever uh, see a person who has gone the route of antinomianism and they get drunk all the time or get hopped up on drugs all the time, their body will start to reflect that. But if you are filled with God the Holy Spirit for most of the time and you're growing in grace and in knowledge, your body will reflect that. And it will even reflect that in your health. Now that doesn't mean if you're in bad health that, you're, that you are necessarily going in the wrong direction. You can take it to the extreme. But uh, uh, your mental attitude, it, it does reflect itself in the body. So what I'm telling you is, if you have a mental attitude of grace, and if you're growing in grace and in knowledge, and you're learning the Word of God and you're understanding these things, it will reflect itself even on your outward appearance. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things and make them a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. And Father, we pray for our country during this uh, worldwide war on terror that if it be your will, you will continue to shield us from the terrorist threat. 
and we pray for our president that you will continue to give him, him wisdom in dealing with our enemy and will you continue to confuse the counsel of our enemy just as you confuse the counsel of Ahipophel. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.